When I was in college, uh, my friends and I went on a road trip from Atlanta uh, up to Pennsylvania to see the Penn State Nittany Lions play in Happy Valley. It was a fun little road trip. Had a good time. Drove back, and we were going to stay overnight in Virginia at my friend's grandfather's house. That's where they lived. And we were taking the highway, taking the interstate, and this was back before Google Maps and all that, so we were using an atlas. Kids, if you don't know what an atlas is, ask your mom and dad, or maybe ask your grandparents. And uh, on the road, or on the map, we noticed that there was a shortcut. You already see where this is going, don't worry. And on the map, it was just so small. It was such a small little pathway that we saw to get to where we wanted to go. It was going to be faster. And so we took that exit and we went down a highway called Jeb Stewart Highway. It looked very short because it was horizontally very short, but it was wrapped around a mountain. And we went down and down and down this mountain. And to this day, we make fun of Jeb Stewart Highway. It's easy to think you know the way you should go. There, there are certain feelings, the instincts that you have tell you in your life, this is the way I should go. This is what I should do. This is how I should behave. And we live in a society that has so many different ways that you can lead your life. You can become incredibly career-driven. You can become incredibly relationship-focused. You can be focused on family, friends. You can be focused on working on yourself, being the person that you want to be. And the concerning thing is, with so many different ways to lead your life, there are so many different ways to mess it all up. How do I know the right way to go? How do I know the way that I should choose? Sometimes I don't hear the voice. This is the way, walk in it. Today we're going to talk about how we navigate the different pathways that life has to offer us. We're in Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 to 14, short passage. And what I want you to see today is that God shows us the way. God is the one who shows us the way. So we're going to look at three paths this morning. The right path, the wrong path, and the hidden path. Or the right way, the wrong way, and the hidden way. Start with the right way, verse 12 of chapter 7. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law And the prophets, this is easily one of the most famous quotes that Jesus ever makes. In fact, if you were to ask someone on the street, hey, what's something that Jesus said? They'd probably give you this. Or they'd say, do not judge. But you can probably learn a lot about a culture based on what they think Jesus' most famous saying is. But what might surprise you is this is not original to Christ. You may have heard this before, but... The negative version of this commandment, do not do unto others as you would not have them do to you, had been in circulation for centuries. It's attributed to Confucius, centuries before Christ. The rabbi Hillel, who we have talked about before in this series on the good life, he said the same thing, do not do unto others that you would not have them do to you. Even the Didache, which is a uh, a sort of a teaching, a document that's in the Apostolic Fathers, which is a collection of works that were written in the generation after the apostles. Even the Didache, which is a Christian document, tells people how to get baptized, how to take the Lord's Supper. It's like a handbook for worship. Even that book quotes the negative version of the commandment. But Jesus, much like he's done in other portions of this sermon where he says, You have heard it said, but I say to you. He leaves out that you've heard it said, and he simply gives the positive command. That's his contribution. He says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. He inverts the proverb. 
Now, hopefully you can see the difference between the positive and the negative command. The negative command is a life that looks at myself, looks at my frustrations, looks at my pet peeves, looks at the things that inconvenience me and determining in myself, I'm not going to be that way in other people's lives. I'm not going to be a distraction. I'm not going to get in anybody's way. I'm not going to be a burden. You might call it courtesy, common courtesy. That's how many of us live. We live out the negative version of the command. We do it quite naturally, actually. The other is more proactive. It is evaluating my needs, my wants, my desires, and ensuring, taking the positive step of making sure that other people that maybe don't have them or can't have access to them do, even to the cost of myself. This is why we call it the golden rule. And we are really good at living out the negative version of this commandment. We really are. In fact, Robert Mounts, who's a a New Testament commentator, said the golden rule in its negative form could be satisfied by doing nothing. We don't want to inconvenience anybody. I don't want to be a burden in anybody's life. We do this in our relationships with other people uh, about sharing Christ. We'll say, oh, I don't want to, they seem like they're they're moving down the path. They'll accept Christ. I don't want to say anything or do anything that'll push them further away, so we do nothing. Better to do nothing than risk the possibility that I might negatively impact someone's life. We do it in conversations. We have friends or relatives that we know are up to destructive behavior in their life. And we see it, and we want to call it out. But instead, we're like, I'm just going to stay out of the way. I don't want to sound heavy-handed. I don't want to sound legalistic. They know I go to church. I don't want to be that person. Our culture is really good at making slogans. And so what we've done is we take this commandment, do not do unto others what you would not have them do to you, and we've just shortened it down. Our ethos is don't do, don't do, just don't, do not do anything, live your life. We don't help, we don't encourage, we don't challenge, we don't share, we don't get involved, we just don't. Nike may have said just do it, but our culture is much the opposite just don't. But we look at the positive expression of this commandment and we think that's the right way to live. We think that's the way that God wants us to live. God has shown us the right way to go is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what's interesting is many of us agree that that's the right way to live. Many of us say that is the height of morality, and Jesus reinforces the idea by saying this sums up the law and the prophets. Our instinct that this commandment is the right way to live is actually an accurate instinct. It is the right way to live, but we don't do it. What's more is the culture around us agrees that do unto others as you would have them do unto you is the right way to live. Some of us grew up in a public school that had do unto others as you would have them do unto you on the wall of the school. People fight about the Ten Commandments being in school. I don't think anybody would argue about that being on the wall. Maybe just out of principle, but the the commandment is so universal in both forms that it covers so many different populations. You'd have a hard time finding someone that genuinely didn't believe that if everybody just did unto other people what they wanted done to them, our society would be a better place. Probably some philosophical person out there that's written a a dissertation probably has a dissenting opinion. But other than that, you probably can't find anybody that would say, yeah, if we just did that, things would be a lot better. 
The negative version of the command, do not do to other people what you would not have them do to you. That's who we are. But the positive version, do unto others as you would have them do to you. That's who we wish we were. And our whole society wishes the same. This is the kind of person I wish we were. So why don't we do that? Why don't we actually walk that path? Why don't we go the way that God has shown us to go? We live in a country where nobody agrees on anything. We just had an election this week. Don't know if you heard about it. It's been mentioned a couple times. And every four years, we have an election for a president, and every four years, half of the country isn't happy about the result. No matter who gets elected, half of us are like, meh. Unless it was like Reagan in like 1980 something, his second term. It was like the whole map was red. Everybody loved Reagan. A little side history note there for you. Don't know why I went that route. But we can agree on so little. Here is a, an ethos, a model, a moral code that we can all get behind and we don't do it. It's because we can't. It's because the wrong way seems so much better. Let's talk about the wrong way. Let's talk about verse 13. Verse 13 says, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. Jesus makes a comparison, seemingly unrelated, makes a comparison between these two different pathways, these two different ways to go. And he starts with the hidden path and then he sets it aside, the narrow path. He starts with that, sets it aside, and he says, let's talk about the wide path. Let's talk about what that is first. And he describes it in four ways. First, he says that it's wide, right? A lot of room, a lot of room for different kinds of people. A lot of different traffic can be on there. It's, it's, it's wide enough for people who walk. It's wide enough for people who drive. It's wide enough for people who ride bikes. It's wide enough for, pe wide enough for everybody to just go right on through. He says it's easy. It's well-traveled. It's the, the dirt is packed down. There's no major rocks or obstructions in it. You can just go down the road. Like the nicest little road you've ever been down. No bumps. No, nothing to stub your toe on. You just get to keep going. Then he says it leads to destruction. What's he talking about there? What kind of destruction are we talking about? He's talking about eternal destruction. He's talking about the kind of destruction of a life that's separated eternally from God that doesn't wind up in the house of the Lord. It winds up away from him. And then he says, and maybe this is the most concerning part, there are many who travel it. It seems to say that, and I believe this, at some point all of us are on that road. Many are on this way. It's the way of most people. This is a vivid metaphor. As I was getting ready this week for this sermon, I was thinking about how to explain this, and then I thought, well, Jesus has kind of already done that for us. The visual imagery is so strong that there's really not a need to dive in as to what a path is and what a way is and what does a gate do and all this exegetical stuff. What I'd rather do is let Jesus unlock the, the, the metaphor a little bit more for us. So I want you to close your eyes. I know that's a risk. Some of you have already done it. It's great. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture sort of a picturesque country setting. And you're on a pathway. You're on a road. It's a dirt road. And you're just walking along. And off to your left you see a fence. It's like a, a fence for, for livestock, for cows. And you can see up in the distance on the hills behind the fence, you can see the cattle that live there. Maybe they're Holsteins or Black Angus. You, you see them up there and they look fat and happy and they're enjoying the, the day. And you see off to your right you see sort of trees, just oak trees lining the pathway. 
It looks really nice. The, the sun is shining. It's not too hot. It's not too bright outside. It's just perfect weather for going on a walk. And you see the sunlight dancing in between the, the, tree, the, the leaves of the trees, and it's making shadows move on the ground as the wind gently blows. And you're noticing as you walk, as you continue down this path, you notice that the fence that's off to your side, off to your right, is coming down at an intersect the path that you're on, and you think, oh, I'm going to have to figure out a way around this gate. But when you get to the gate, you see that there's actually not a gate at all. There used to be a gate. The hinges are still there, but it's, it's gone. What they have instead is what's called a cattle guard. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's a, it's a dugout spot in the gate where the gate should be, and there's basically bars spaced in there so a cow can't get out. They can't navigate it with their hooves but a person can just walk over it. It's very simple. Car can drive over it. And so you don't even break stride. You just keep going and you keep walking along the path. You can open your eyes now. This is the wide path. This is the wide path. I think many of us believe that the wide path that leads to destruction is dark is scary. It's like the forest in the Wizard of Oz where the trees attack Dorothy. It's not like that. If it was, nobody would walk that path. Nobody would go that way. It's picturesque. It's comfortable. It's easy. There's a scene in The Lion King where Mufasa, uh, the king, is showing Simba, his son, all the different parts of their kingdom. They're up on a hill, and everything's so beautifully lit on the African savanna. And then there's this dark place over in the distance. And, of course, Simba says, what's that dark place over there? And Mufasa says, you must never go there. That place is dangerous. And, of course, Simba goes there. But you know how he had to, what he had to go through to get there? the well-lit, sunlit, beautiful places in order to get to the place that was dangerous, that would ultimately lead to so much hurt. So if everything's so beautiful and so nice and feels so good, how would I know if I'm on the wide path? How would I know? We need to look at the kind of traveler that we are and the kind of travelers that surround us. There's three kinds of travelers on the wide path. The first, the first is the self-reliant one. The self-reliant one. This is a self-focused person. And a self-reliant person is somebody who thinks, I can navigate the path on my own. I can, I can get down the road by myself. I don't need anybody's help. Or if I do need help, it's just a little bit of boost. It's a little bit of a help with a small thing. But I'm going to carry my load down the road as far as I need to go. And I might be willing to help somebody else out. I might pick somebody else up, help them readjust their pack, give them some extra things that I don't need. As long as I feel like I'm far enough down the road for the day, if I'm in a good spot, I'll help them out. I might move some boulders out of the way, make the path a little easier for other people. But don't you slow me down. Don't you hold me back. I'm going to earn my way down the road. And it's all about making progress. It's the self-reliant person, the self-focused person. There's another kind of self-focused person. This is the self-satisfied. The self-satisfied traveler is all about the trip being enjoyable. If you're on a road trip with this kind of person, they're the ones that has like seven or eight different mixes for you to listen to on the way. They're all about enjoying the journey. They don't care where it goes. They don't care where we wind up. As long as we're having a good time on the way, everything's great. Anything that makes the trip more enjoyable, more comfortable, more relaxing. They're not interested in making progress as long as they're having a good time. And the idea that there might be a gate somewhere with people who are behind it and a creator that's behind it, they don't care. You know what? In fact, 
I love the idea, if you're a self-satisfied traveler, you might love the idea that there's a gate where everybody just gets to go through. And, and the kinds of people that would be behind a locked, oh, I don't really want to hang out with a locked gate kind of person. That's the self-satisfied person. And then there's the self-actualized traveler. Maybe this is you. These are the spiritual folks among us. They're the ones that see that the journey itself is really important. And everybody that goes down the road is going to have a different thing to take in and they're going to see a different thing, but it's going to be significant for them. It's going to matter. It's going to have an impact on them. And we all might see different things, but we're all going in the right place. And so they look for significance in the things around them. They might even wonder, who is it that has made this path? Who is it that owns all these things that surround us? And what can we learn about them? They might say, oh, well, they've put a fence in over here on the right. That must mean that the, the person that owns all this wants us to respect boundaries and be disciplined. And so I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to be rigorous in my studies. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat right. Or maybe they, they have a spiritual rigorousness in their life. Or maybe they, they see the cows and they think, oh, the, the person who owns all this, made all this, must love animals because he's got some up there or she's got some up there. So we must enjoy animals. We've got to support animals. We've got to protect animals. Or you see the trees. He must love nature. I'm going I'm to be a person of nature. If we invest ourselves in the environment, then we're doing something that honors the one who made all this. Or they think, you know what? The person who made this has made the pathway so easy. He must not care how we travel just as long as we get there. And no matter what way we get there, whether it's car or bus or train or walking, as long as we're making progress, okay, great. I cannot stress this enough to you today that the sinister thing about the wide path is that it feels like the right path. The sinister thing about the wrong way is that it feels like the right way. It may even feel like God has shown you the way to go. You may feel like this is what God wants me to do. And our feelings are not bad. But when it is the only compass you navigate your life by, they will mislead you. And you will be on the wrong path. And the tragedy of tragedies is that you won't even know it. You'll just keep going. We all agree that the right way is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We agree that that's the right way to live life. But what we've done is we've sat settled. We've satisfied ourselves by a lesser command which is one that you hear all the time. It's on the sign outside the gate as you pass through in the wide way, the easy way. It says as long as you don't hurt other people, you can travel however you like. And that's what we accept. We do not do to other people what we would not have them do to us. And we keep going. But praise God, there is a hidden way. There's a hidden way, a third way. Listen to verse 14. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Jesus again uses four descriptors for this way. He says the gate is narrow. It's not easy to access. It's not easy to get through. It's not gonna just accept anybody any means of travel, it can't. It's a narrow gate. He says it's hard. When you contemplate it, when you look at it, when you see it, you think, oh man, that's gonna demand so much. And maybe it's really not even all that difficult, but by comparison to the easy path, it seems so daunting. But he reminds us that it is a way that leads to life. 
to the real place of the creator, a place with God, a place in the kingdom forever. And then he says that it's hidden. He said, and those who find it are few. Those who find it are few. There's a sense of discovery. Once again, Jesus is painting a vivid picture for us. And so at the risk again, I'll ask you to close your eyes. Put yourself back on that pathway. Put yourself walking down that road. Same setting, beautiful sunlight. And as you're navigating this road, someone taps you on the shoulder and says, look over there. And you look off to your right amidst the trees, the trees that are there. And you see just what looks to be a hedgerow or, or some brambles, some thorns. It's just incredibly densely wooded right there. But you do see, connecting to the road you're on, a little path. And so you walk over and you go a little ways into this wooded area, maybe 100 feet or so. And you see that there's a gate covered by vines and thorns and thistles. And you see that that gate is locked. The gate's too tall. You, you can't really climb over it. And the thorns and the thistles and the wooded undergrowth is too thick to navigate your way around it. And so you sit there considering how might, if I wanted to travel this path, how could I? And you look down and there's a key. Almost by coincidence. The key's broken. It's been trampled in the dirt. But you're like, surely not. Surely what coincidence this would be that the key that opens this gate would be sitting right here in the ground. But you pick it up. And you put it in. And it opens right up. And you walk on through along a difficult path that's rocky, going uphill, full of woods. Sometimes it's barely cut out. But you keep going. There is, you can open your eyes now, there is something that swells inside of us at the idea that there is a secret place that has answers, that has comfort, that has peace, that's a place just for us. It's in our movies and stories. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, he has to find the hidden tomb under the ground. It's called the Well of Souls. I had to look that up. I didn't remember. It's called the Well of Souls when he puts the stick in and it shows where the ark is. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the kids find the wardrobe. They go in and they find a secret place that only they know about called Narnia. In the Lord of the Rings, there's the forest, the wooded kingdom of Lothlorien. It's hidden away, it's protected, it's guarded. Where the fellowship rests after Gandalf dies. Even the book, The Secret Garden, has a secret garden. I didn't read it, it's in the title, I'm assuming. Biggest misnomer ever if it's not a secret garden. People are like, it's about a city, Travis. What did, what's wrong with you that everybody knows about? It's in our conspiracy theories. There are people that think there's a secret location where the moon landing was filmed. There's a secret place where they experiment on aliens. There's a secret place that has knowledge. It's even when we travel go down the interstate, the road trip, is it more fun to stop at one of the thousands of restaurants that line the highway or is it more fun to find the secret hole in the wall place that you come back from the trip and you're like, we got to, I got to tell you about this one place we ate. I didn't think we were going to leave there alive, but it was amazing. <laughs> Pretty sure their health code inspection was an F, but it was delicious. We love the idea of a secret place, a hidden way. There's something about us that calls out to that place. When I was a kid, I had my own room, of course, but where I really liked to read was in the bathroom closet. 
I would take the laundry basket out, I would take a light in there, and I would close the door, and that would be my hidden place. Some of you still like to read in the bathroom. We truly believe that there is something special in a hidden place. This is what the narrow gate is. Few people find it. It has to be shown to them. God has to show it to us. And that's the major difference between the wide gate and the narrow gate. Anybody can find the wide gate. If you lead your life however you want, and you do whatever you want, you will be on the wide path. You'll take the wide path. You'll go through the wide gate, and life will probably be fairly easy. Maybe. If you just go with the flow, the narrow gate, though, the difficult way, that has to be shown to you. Jesus has to reveal it to us. You're not going to see it on your own. I can't stress this enough. One of the core ideas of the Christian faith is that God reveals himself to us of his own will, of his own accord. John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the gate. He also says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's it all, and he has to reveal himself to you. If you think that you're just going to keep going down the road, living life, and eventually you'll just stumble on Jesus, or you'll find him because you're a good enough person, that's not how it works. The person you find will not be him because he has to show himself to you. He has to reveal himself to you. The only difference between a believer and a non-believer is not how good of a person they are or how bad of a person they are. It's that the person who believes has found the gate. The gate has been shown to them. The Spirit of God, he taps us on the shoulder and he says, look over there. And you're drawn inexplicably to this way that many people would look at and say, that seems so difficult. Why would you go that way? Why do you stand for so much? Why do you care about this guy who died 2,000 years ago? And you say, I know it's harder, but it's the path that I've been shown and I'm going to walk it. And Jesus is our guide. You can't find your way through the path. You can't cut through it. Self-reliance has no place on the narrow path. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. You don't know the way. Self-actualization doesn't work either because Jesus is the one who shows us the truth, who shows us what we're supposed to do. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us and guides us over the rocky terrain of the difficult path. The self-satisfied person looking for joy in the journey and, yes, it's there, but it's provided by Christ. It's not self-satisfaction. It's Christ-satisfaction. You see, Jesus has opened the way for us. This is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He's the only one that walked the right path, doing unto others as he would have them do to us. We wanted someone to pay for our sins. We wanted somebody to take the fall for us. And we're incapable of doing it. And Jesus does it. He does for us what we wish we could do. What we wish we had the power to do and we didn't. And so he walks that path for us so that he can get us off the wrong way and put us on the hidden path. The secret way that only he knows, that only he has access to. He offers you the key himself, broken, trodden down in the dirt. And he says, will you take it? And just like before, how would I know? How would I know that I was on the difficult way? If I can't trust my feelings, how would I know? Well, if the wide path is self-focused, then the narrow path must be others-focused. Are you focused on Christ? Are you focused on your Messiah, your King, on what he wants? Do you let him determine how you live your life? Do you let him guide you? Do you let him walk with you? 
Are you focused with those of us who are on the path with you, other believers? You're not the only one on the narrow path. You're not the only one who's found the secret way. There's others. Will you help us carry our burdens? We're not going to get through this if we don't help each other. If you're not a part of a church, if you're not connected to a connect group, if you're not doing those things, if you don't have people to travel with, I'm afraid you might fall back to the wide path. And that's a myth that many of us think that once you're on the narrow path, you don't ever interact with the people on the wide path again. You're on two totally divergent ways. That's the weird thing about the narrow path. That's one of the things that makes it so difficult. It crisscrosses and intersects with the wide path regularly. You encounter people on the wide path all the time. And many of us are so fearful that we just put our head down and we keep walking. Or we think that wide path looks mighty easy. I'm going to jump back on it and travel down for a while. Jesus will pull me back. He'll get me back on the narrow path. There's probably another entry point somewhere down the road. Jesus calls us when we intersect those people on the wide path, the self-reliant person who's so overwhelmed with the weight and the standards that they put on themselves, the burden that crushes them to reach out and carry their burden with them, the self assured person who's looking for spiritual meaning in everything. We're supposed to reach out to that self-actualized person and show them Christ, tell them who they've been looking for all this time. And the self-satisfied person, they may be laughing and enjoying the journey, but there are times when the journey is hard and it crushes them and we're called to pick them up. When you do that, the Holy Spirit uses you to become that voice that says, look over there. And that person looks up and they too might find the narrow path and the gate and they join us on the journey. And that is how you love other people, by showing them the gate, the narrow way of Christ. Let God use you to show other people the way because God shows us how we're supposed to go. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for showing us the way that we should go. I pray, Lord God, that if there is anyone in this room that is not on the hidden path, that the gate would swing wide for them this morning and you would give them the courage and the strength and above all else, the trust and faith to walk through. Lord, let us help others along this journey that we might wind up at your house and be filled and satisfied by your presence. It's in your name we pray, amen.